I'm really excited about today's episode. This is one of the most interesting topics that we've had come through Midwest Whitetail in quite some time. Our Michigan Pro Staff member, Mike Alberta, and his brother, Brian, are going to dive into the topic of uh, blood trailing deer with dogs. And Mike's brother, Brian, is actually a member of a group that trails deer with dogs. When we get through watching this, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this topic afterwards. Welcome to Midwest Whitetail, the off-season show. Today I'm with my brother Brian. He and his dog Bendy have now completed two years of dog tracking, and I just thought it would be interesting today to talk to him a little bit about those tracks and uh, just give us some information on what dog tracking is all about. What made you decide to get into tracking deer? Well, it's, I actually have to thank my wife for it. Um, all of her life she's wanted a bloodhound, we had done some research on different dogs and she kept hounding me. All the research we did, they said if you have a bloodhound, you have to work the dog. So we ended up getting a blood, we ended up deciding on getting the bloodhound. So we said, well, how are we going to work it? And me being that I've been a hunter my whole life, it just made sense to track deer with it. So I've been out hunting and I shoot a deer and once I take up that track, I'm using things like my common sense, a flashlight, my eyes to look for blood. But now you're saying uh, a dog can be another tool in your toolbox to use to help find deer. Dog doesn't need blood, okay? Doesn't. Does not need blood. You know, you, we, use, we still use the flashlight. We still use everything that you talk about, all except the common sense. If the dog tells you to do one thing, and you're at the track and common sense tells you to do the other, trust me, go with the dog. Deer are so unpredictable. If you think they're gonna do one thing, they do another. If the dog tells you to do something, you, you do it. Okay, so why do, why do clients call you? Um, Just give me some. There, there's really no one specific reason why they call. Um, they could be colorblind. Oh. They could have ran out of the, ran out of blood. Okay, that's probably the, the number one reason because they run out of blood. Um, but there's, I mean, there's there's several things to the, the weather, rain, okay, if rain comes, washes the blood away. Even the heat, I was in Kentucky this last year, the first week, and it was 96 degrees. And there was a couple calls we got that they felt it was a confirmed kill, okay, yep. but they wanted to get the dog out there and make no bones about it, they wanted that deer found quickly because yeah. of the temperatures. And some of them, I mean, they, they shoot a buck of a lifetime, okay? Right. And they don't want, they they don't want to mess that track up at all, okay? So they call in a dog just to help them because it's, I mean, it's a buck of a lifetime. And I've shot my deer and I have never personally called in a tracker before. How do I, what do I do? How do I go about that? There's, there's a national organization called United Blood Trackers, okay? That is nationally the whole United States. You can go on to their website and they've got a map. You can click on the map, okay? So then what that'll do is now bring up a list of trackers for the whole state and you can choose, okay, the tracker that's close to you. But there's also, you know, another way, um, like Michigan that I know of, uh, Oklahoma, Kentucky, uh, Missouri, we all have tracking networks, I guess you would call them. It's, a, it's the same situation. You go on there, click on the map, see what county you're in, who the tracker is, and even calling a tracker, okay, just because you call a tracker um, doesn't mean that we need to come out, okay? Call them just for advice. But I had three calls in a row after talking to them, 
hearing what they had, I give them some advice on what to do, and all three of them found their deer on their own without even a tracker coming out. Good. So. That's good to know. I've called in a tracker and you show up. What's the next step we have to take? I show up and for, you know, every, like I said, every state is different. For in Michigan, okay, I'm a registered tracker with the DNR. So what I have to do is get all your information down um, and I text it in to our DNR, letting them know that we have started on a track. If you're not registered, okay, you don't have to do that, but if you are registered, you get some, some perks with that. I, would, I guess I would call them perks. The hunter is able to carry his weapon with him and dispatch the animal while I am present with okay. the dog. Okay? okay. Where if I'm not a registered tracker, okay, the hunter cannot carry his weapon with him. A lot of these deer, I mean, you, we, we find alive, especially the, the gut shot deer, you know. Um, they're still they're, alive. They're still alive. Find them. Yep. Okay, so we get Bendy out okay. there, and what is she smelling? Is she sm does she have to smell blood? She what, is, what no, is and that's, that's, that's just it. Okay, down girl. Okay, dad's got to go to work. Um, what she's smelling, okay is the interdigital gland. Okay, that's first and foremost, the interdigital gland. Every hoof has an interdigital gland. Yep. And when you shoot a deer, they dispense an odor out of that um, onto the, you know, as they run onto the ground. And that's what we train right. her on. Okay. But she really, she's smelling the blood. She's smelling the interdigital gland. Um, any hair follicles that come off. Um, and every deer smells different. Okay. So once we get her locked on to the deer that she's supposed to be, um, if you have a trained, if you have a well-trained dog, that dog is not going to veer off that that trail. I mean, it's going to track that deer and that deer only. Do you have that situation where rain has come in and you've lost the blood trail? Uh, for me, I, I can go nowhere. I have no idea what to do next. I call the dog. Is he going to have the same difficulty with that rain washing the scent away? Absolutely not. Um, in some cases, in a lot of the cases, the rain actually helps helps the scent. And why is that? Especially if you're in really dry, dry conditions, hot, dry conditions, okay, that scent just, just burns up. Where you get that moisture and it just it makes that scent scent just so vibrant. Like I said, they that blood is still there. It may be washed away where you can't see it, but that scent is still there. When I get to the point where I don't think I can track this deer any longer, I know you've told me before there are some things that I should not shouldn't do. Talk to me about those. Okay. Well, a couple things. We want you to mark that hit site. And while you're tracking, okay, um, if at all possible, I know it's not, but try to stay to one side of the track. Why is that? Okay. Because you're gonna walk through that blood, okay? And the more you walk through it, and then you venture to the left, or you venture to the right because you run out of blood, okay? That blood, you don't realize it is still on your feet. Oh, I never okay? thought of that. So that dog, that dog doesn't know, I mean, it's it, not only that blood, just the deer scent in general. Yeah. So it's gonna take a long time to figure that out, okay? So you're saying the dog could get off track, it could take a while to get back on track. Correct. The perfect scenario is every 25 yards or so, you're dropping some toilet paper for us, okay? And then when you get to the end where you've lost blood, back out, back straight back out, okay? Um, I know it's tempting to, oh, let's make one or two passes, which one or two passes probably wouldn't be so bad, but one or two passes always leads to four or five or six or seven. And before you know it, you're into it a half hour, I know. And you have messed it up completely. I, I know a lot of times when I'm tracking over the years, I get to that last blood, I can't find anything. So the first thing I do is start to make those art. And and if you are not going to call a dog, yeah. okay, by all means, you try to do everything possible. But if you're going to call a dog or you think you're going to call a dog, that is one of the number one things that's going to mess that dog up. Okay, well, let's go on uh, three or four tracks we want to show you. These tracks you're going to see, keep in mind that these are some of my easiest tracks I had last year. Also, they're edited up because of time restraint. Typically, there are restarts and all kinds of different scenarios that go into tracking. Please keep this in mind when you hire a tracking team just because they don't go like gangbusters like on this video that something is wrong. It's actually just the opposite. 
Ben, right here. Track. Okay, I've given the uh, track command. So I just sit back and uh, this one here is like a six hour old track. So it's a fairly straightforward track. Uh, she tracks uh, pretty consistently, 24 hours. But the uh, older the track is, the slower she'll track. Where she'll track at a pretty good pace here because it's only six hours old. Leave. I was seeing a fair amount of blood on this track, but the uh, hunter called us anyways. Um, the deer was heading toward this swamp up here, and he didn't know if it went in 30 yards or 150 yards or made it all the way across. Here you can tell she's really honed in on the scent and uh, it's going to make pretty quick work of this. Where'd he run? Where'd she run to? She ran up that hill. Okay. It's gonna take her a bit to just putz around. And then once she gets, she'll go left, she'll go right. She'll uh, just get, okay. The reason it takes so much longer on an older track is it's had 24 hours for that wind to move that scent um, all over the place. And with the different terrain here, like on this one, she uh, yeah, she was all over the place on this one, but uh, she advanced the track in the right direction. It just took her a lot longer than a hot track. In a hot track, I mean something less than 12 hours old. Blood right here. I got blood right here. This first spot uh, where I just found some blood was the first spot where we found blood and he had already gone, I estimate about 175 yards. Then coming up here, there's a splatter of blood on a tree that the deer hit. And that was actually the last spot that uh, we had found blood on this whole track. Yeah, she hit this tree right here. Right there. Now coming up, if you watch closely, um, Bindi picks her head up just slightly and just does a quick head check. And that is a prime example right there if she's starting to win the actual animal. So at that point, I was pretty confident this deer was laying here someplace. Good job, girl. Good job. This one here, we're picking up the uh, track, but we're probably a minute into it right here. This one is fast and furious to say the least.
Good girl. Yeah, right here, Ben. Right here. Track. What she's doing right here, she's going back to the hit site and going the other direction to just make sure she's got the right direction of travel with the deer. Notice how she's smelling all of the vegetation, um, all the high vegetation. This track, there was absolutely zero blood on the whole track. There was a little bit of hair at the hit site, and that was it. Yeah, it's. The, I mean, the scent is everywhere here. So just let her figure this out. Let her figure out the turn. When she gets to this point, the wind is really heavily out of the north blowing south. So it's blowing from her right going to her left and that wind is blowing all that scent down left. So she's got to go down there and check that out. And she realizes that that's the wrong direction. So she turns around and goes back up. Hey, there he is. Woo. Good job, girl. Good job. Woo. I didn't see any blood. I didn't see no blood. Nope. I think blood trailing deer is a super important topic, but unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of either misconceptions or confusions over whether it's legal in various states. Here in Iowa, for example, the regulations say that you cannot pursue deer with dogs. It doesn't make any kind of an exception for whether or not they're wounded or whether or not you have a weapon or anything like that. So technically, uh, blood trailing deer with dogs would be illegal here. I know some other states are similar to that too. So make sure that before you call up uh, somebody that does this, you know, one of these members of these networks, that you first check with the game warden to make sure that it's legal in the state where you hunt. And I, th I think too that if you called an Iowa game warden in your area and you told him what the situation was, uh, there may be some flexibility in those regulations too. But that's uh, technically here, it says that you cannot pursue deer with dogs. Uh, it, it's uh, I wish that it was legal because it would be a lot of fun to have a blood trailing dog. And I've got Bentley right here by my side. <laughs> Gotta figure out something useful to do with this dog. But, uh, so that's it basically for this week's episode. We've, we're gonna, we were gonna bring a, another one of the throwbacks this week, but this segment was long enough and I thought important enough that we ran the whole thing rather than cutting it up into a smaller piece. So we'll see you back here next week for more of the same what, what we've been doing, you know, uh, off season tips plus the throwbacks uh, on next Monday. I well, appreciate you joining me. We'll see you right back here again next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail. And remember to always dream big.